So I know we have all been spending a lot of time thinking about Aaron and his life and what kind of person he was and what he did. I know many of you in the room knew him, knew him well. Others probably never got to meet him in person, saw him on a mailing list or read his blog posts um, and are now trying to, to figure out what we've lost, who we've lost. And for me, you know, I was lucky enough, I got to live with Aaron for a while and we got to be good friends and work on things together. But I found I was always trying to figure out exactly who he was and what he was up to because he was such a, a complicated and contradictory human being uh, and he'd get you in these ways that you weren't expecting. Um, some, of the, some of this was simple, obvious stuff. You know, I, He and I had met before, but we moved to San, Fr San Francisco at the same time. I came here to work for the EFF. Uh, he was just in the process of selling Reddit and going to Condé Nast and going through the, the messy divorce that he had with the other co-founders. And so I sent him an email and said, hey, I'm setting up a share house. Do you want, to, like, do you want a place to live? Um, and he said yes. Um, and so we had this, this rambling Victorian in this apartment building. Uh, and I said, oh, we've got all these you know, open rooms we need to fill. And he's like, oh, there's this tiny little one in the corner. I'll take that. This, this room was the size of a... You know, it was a closet, basically. Um, and he was the, we were pretty sure he was the wealthiest person in the building. He just sold Reddit, um, but he wanted this, this tiny little thing. Um, and getting, getting to know him was weird. Like, I, I, I knew him, I knew his blog, I'd met him before, but living with him, the first experience was he was so shy. Like, he'd just be there and, like, in his own little world, struggling to talk to people until the, the conversation took the right turn. You'd say the right thing to him, and he would come alive. Um, and he would come so alive. Um, I know Danny mentioned the Chinese room argument, but I remember the, the, the day that somehow I prodded him about that. Um, and then for the next week, you know, like, we, we were going at it. I, like, I think he was totally wrong about the Chinese room argument, actually. Still, I st still do. Um, his position was crazy. Uh, he defended a crazy position very well. Um, and I had to argue him into so many weird corners to, to get anywhere. Um, I, I remember another scene. We had a, a film crew who showed up and stayed in our house and filmed this, this thing, steal this film. You can go and see it on the internet. You can see Aaron in it. Um, and we, we were, there were a documentary crew talking about copyright and trying to, trying to film these takes in the middle of the night in our cramped little living room. And everyone was kind of drunk and there was chaos. And I remember some of us were really struggling to say anything coherent to a camera. But someone pointed a camera at Aaron and he caught fire. Like, he, he just, he taught me how to, like, speak to a room or speak, speak to a, um, a television or whatever it was. He just had a message that he'd simplified out of the ether uh, and could deliver. Um, and that was the same skill he turned to politics um, and to so much else that he did in his intellectual life. And it was beautiful to watch. So, and he paired that with this, you know, honestly, he had a flair for self-promotion. Uh, there wouldn't be hundreds of people in this room and hundreds of people in all, all the rooms for all the memorials that he's ha had in different cities and millions of people reading about him if he didn't have some little talent uh, at getting the things he was doing out to the world in a way that people would notice. Um, people noticed his 16-year-old self, his 14-year-old self. But he wasn't just a giant ego who kind of was out there promoting himself because he thought he was awesome. He actually, the one thing he failed to care about often was taking care of himself. And I, I remember like living with him and, and trying to get, get him to eat and he, he wouldn't, the, and he, had, he had medical things that he was struggling with. And I said, Aaron, you know, like, how does this work? Like, let's talk about it. Surely you've read the research on this condition. Like, we can go through, through the, you know, what's been tried. And he said, no, I haven't read any of it. Like, I don't know anything about it. And I said, Aaron, you devour books. Like, I can see you devouring books. You've, you've read five this week. 
like you have a stack of academic journal articles by your bed. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about half of them. Why haven't you read anything about this condition that is making your own life harder? And he just said, well, I don't think I'm that important. The world's important. Like, and, you know, watching that happen was, was kind of, um, was hard. You, you know, you struggle to take care of him. And he also had these days that were down. I mean, I guess it was a down day in the end that got him. In between the days when he was doing amazing amounts of stuff, you all know how much he did. He was too young to possibly have done a third of the things he managed, and with, who knows what he would have achieved within another 50 years. But in between those days, there'd be, there'd be days when he was just blue. And I, I remember I caught him on one of those and said, Aaron, like, there's amazing stuff. We can go and do it right now. And he just said, no, I, the code, it's all terrible. It's ugly. It's broken. I'm like, OK, we, we, you know, let's do some science. And he, he'd say, no, like, you know, the data doesn't work. It sucks. Like, it's too hard. And I said, surely there must be something that you'd be happy doing that really, like, would feel right. And he stopped for a while and said, yes, actually, typography. <laughs> I could do typography. Anyway, so he was contradictory. You never knew exactly what to make of him. Um, he was brilliant and sometimes infuriating like, and wrong, like the Chinese room argument. But then sometimes, <laughs> You know, I guess I'm talking about paradoxes in Aaron. Sometimes he was infuriating and wrong and brilliant at the same time. Um, and I have one story about a paradox. You know, he and I were talking about moral philosophy, ethical philosophy. We were both interested in these ideas, the Singerian ideas of, you know, actually we have a responsibility to find the thing that we can do that, that makes the most difference to the universe, to the world, and, and makes it better, whatever that means. But... I had, had just read a, a paper about a paradox showing that actually if you write down all of our most compelling intuitions about what it is for the world to be good so that we can know how to make it better, um, you write them all down, you can actually mathematically prove it's a recent result, 10 years old, by a, a Swedish philosopher. Our, our deepest intuitions about this are flatly contradictory. It's a paradox. Like There is actually no co completely coherent definition uh, of what makes the world better. And Aaron just looked at me and said, that's completely wrong. Like, actually, no, it's like this, this, and this. And I said, Aaron, you're arguing with a mathematical theorem. I have a proof of it right here. Like, you're not pointing out any flaws in the logic in this paper. And he said, no, no, it's like... And then I... I I, I stopped and I, I, I stared at him for a while and I said, I'm not sure you're right, but actually maybe we can find a way out of this theorem. Like, it's not an impossibility theorem, it's not a paradox. Actually, it's, maybe it's more like an uncertainty theorem. We can rehabilitate it as a, a kind of um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle for morality. You can't be completely sure about what's right but you can actually pin the amount of uncertainty down to a minimum and still get the right answers to obvious moral dilemmas. Um, and so he and I like, actually sat down and wrote a paper about this, which we still haven't published. I, like, I now actually have a, this is a thing I promised to, to Aaron's ghost. I'm going to finish that paper and maybe people will read it. Um, but he was paradoxical, and yet he got so much done, did so many amazing things at the same time. There's a lot more I want to say, and there are a lot of things that we all need to do um, because Aaron's loss reminded us or pointed out that they needed to be done. Um, some of them are things that matter a lot to this community here in this room. Uh, we need to free the literature, the scientific literature that Aaron died trying to free. And we also need to figure out what we can what we can do to fix the insane criminal justice system in the United States. But I've said enough for tonight, and 
there are other people who will take up these threads.